Hi everyone, John Huang here. I want to welcome you back to another episode of Hoofbeat. In this segment, we challenge you to solve diagnostically difficult real-world cases alongside experienced clinicians. As always, I'm here with my partner, Dr. Cindy Feng. Hi everyone, this is Cindy Feng. So this week, we are tackling one of John's cases. Back from last episode, to walk us through this case is our colleague, Dr. Shreya Trivedi. All right. So this is a case of a 57-year-old woman that's admitted to you for confusion and word-finding difficulties for one day. So for her history, it's in part provided by accompanying family members who brought her to the ED after noticing that over the past day, she's been saying things that don't really make sense. She seemed to have trouble with placing her words, and at times those words would slightly be slurred. The symptoms were completely new for her. The patient is complaining of moderate to severe headaches that are bilateral over the temples and the vertex, lasting for the past several hours. She has been experiencing similar but milder headaches intermittently over the past several months, but they were less problematic and usually relieved with NSAID. She also notes subjective fevers, which she first noticed months ago They were infrequent at that time, but over the past week have become prominent. She also reports an ongoing rash over her legs, which she describes as slightly itching, but not painful. The rash has actually fluctuated over the last six months. Initially, she saw her PCP, who empirically prescribed her two weeks of prednisone and mycophenolate. The rash improved, but when that prednisone was discontinued, the rash reoccurred. She then saw a dermatologist who did a skin biopsy, which was interpreted as leukoclastic vasculitis. So that biopsy result prompted additional blood tests that were most notable for a positive ANA at a titer ratio of 1 to 640 in a nucleolar pattern and a positive C anca titer. And then further outpatient evaluation had been planned. Her other review of systems was negative. Her past medical history includes only SVT that was ablated two years ago without apparent complications. Aside from a C-section, she denies any other surgeries. She had a normal mammogram, cervical pap smear within the last year and hasn't had colorectal screening. For her family history, aside from hypertension and diabetes, she's not aware of any other illnesses in her parents or siblings. In terms of social history, she was born in Brazil and immigrated to the United States 17 years ago and lives in a house with her family, denies any substance abuse. Her meds include low-dose metoprolol as well as the mycophenolate that she was prescribed. On exam, she's a middle-aged woman resting quietly in bed, alert, fully oriented. She's febrile to 102.4, mildly tachycardic to 105. Her blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation is normal. In terms of her speech, there's an increased latency. She'll follow commands, but with naming objects, there's a little bit of difficulty. And then she occasionally had paraphrasia, where she substitutes nonsensical syllables or words. So for example, instead of saying the word daughter, she would say, this is my botter. Her concentration and delayed recall are intact. Her cranial nerve exam, motor, sensory are all normal in all extremities. She does have scattered palpable purpura over her lower legs. It's non-tender. No rash elsewhere in her body. And aside from the tachycardia, her cardiac, pulmonary, and abdominal exam are normal. Her eye exam is unremarkable, and joint survey reveals no evidence of effusion. So that was the extent of the history available to this patient's admitting physicians. What would you have said and done at this point? Take a moment to think through the case, and we'll compare notes after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Core IM's Hoofbeats. So up until this point, we've been interviewing general internists. But Sandy and I got curious about how specialists might reason through these cases differently. So we sat down with Dr. Michael Phillips, an infectious disease physician here at NYU who is not involved with this case. 
And by the way, if you're assuming that means the diagnosis here is infectious, well, you are anchoring, you are fixating unduly on one piece of data to the exclusion of others. So here he is. So for me to start, it was the timeline. So the timeline about accurately creating that so that you could get a sense of when did these vague headaches start and when did this rash start? How was it characterized? And I think it's always a challenge, particularly in you know, the cases that you guys see, right? You, you're not so much seeing the straight up face that comes in. Here's somebody that's referred in. They've seen other providers. There's medications in the mix. They've had this many month history going on. And yet they're presenting with sort of a new symptom. Something has changed. There was a diagnostic workup going on. There were some labs done, some medical intervention done. Sounds like it got a little bit better. It got worse when the meds changed. But then something happened, and the family was concerned enough to bring the individual to the emergency department. You assume off hours, et cetera. So I'm wondering if, is this a manifestation of the underlying illness yet progressing, or is this potentially a violation of Occam's razor? And are we seeing a sequelae of the medicines, some sort of side effect? You know, are we seeing some secondary infection or event? And, and so those are kind of going through my mind. So I thought this was interesting. The diagnosis might not be immediately obvious to Dr. Phillips, but the tempo of her illness is a familiar clinical scenario to him. The patient who has been sick for some time and now suddenly worsens, develops new symptoms. And it's obvious he has a pre-built logical framework to organize the ways in which her acute symptoms and her chronic disease could be causally related. First possibility, as he mentions, is that she's developed a new manifestation of her original illness. He doesn't give any specific examples, but one can imagine. Say this patient had previously undiagnosed lupus and has now developed lupus cerebritis. Right. And in a similar vein, the new illness could be a complication of the original condition. To stick with your example of lupus, let's say she developed a lupus anticoagulant leading to a thrombotic stroke. Alternatively, she could have developed a complication of her treatment, say an infectious encephalitis, in the context of her immunosuppression. Or the two could be separate disorders, but linked by a common risk factor in this patient. Perhaps this patient has lupus and another autoimmune disease. And the last possibility, of course, is that they could be coincidental, not causally related. I actually can't think of anything that fits that bill, because lupus is related to everything. Dr. Phyllis does this more than once throughout the interview. He questions how the findings are causally related to one another. The A calls B, or B calls A, or the C calls both A and B, and so on. This diagnostic process where you come up with causal models is common, and employing them can help trigger hypothesis generation. So then I'm already starting to think, all right, now I need to think about what is the syndrome that's going on here? How do I tease it out? So the person has neurologic deficits, right? And these other issues going on with now fever, rash. Um, I'm wondering whether she has an underlying encephalitis, so actually brain inflammation, with resultant neurologic findings, or does she have an encephalopathy? In other words, some other systemic illness going on and the brain sort of an innocent bystander, if you will. And we really don't know that yet. Clinically, she has one or the other. If she does have encephalitis, okay, is this an ongoing manifestation of her underlying disease that maybe it probably is likely non-infectious? Does she have a cerebral vasculitis? Does she have some sort of, you know, collagen vascular disease, lupus, whatever, that's sort of driving this? Or does she have encephalitis that's actually infectious? And if it's encephalitis and it's infectious related, is it due to the infection that's undergoing right now? Or are we seeing post-infectious sequelae that we can sometimes see with infections? I mean, measles is a great example, or associate things like vaccines. It's interesting how he spends a lot of time generating models, but he has yet to mention a specific diagnosis. I noticed that too. And it seemed to be a conscious choice on his part. If you remember, at one point, I even prodded him to see if he would be more specific, and he demurred, even though he acknowledged the temptation for him to do so. I'm just curious whether the rashes, do you find yourself kind of going down that rabbit hole, being like the rash is what's going to unlock this case for me if it's an infection, 
One of the problems with infectious disease is that we love to look at, okay, encephalitis plus rash, boom, it drops into a list, right? But sometimes that's helpful. It's sort of reassuring for us sometimes. Sometimes it helps us drive the multitude of diagnostic tests that we can order. But I think with this case and the time frame, it's like, it's almost want to disassociate it because even though this individual had some headaches before and had the rash from before, like the mental status changes are new. So yeah, you're right. If you look at the, you know, if the book it, okay, all right, so rash, mental status, then you start thinking about, you know, let's say varicella, but you, if the rash was some more vesicular or possibly HSV, or then you're looking at rickettsia, it's more particular. And, but again, it's sort of that thing where you're sort of thinking about the whole picture and, and everything. It would be unusual, though, I would say, for somebody for months to have an ongoing infectious illness okay, causing encephalitis. Now, this is one where, as you say, going down that rabbit hole where I'm willing to commit, you know, and sometimes we overcommit, right? And then we find ourselves in trouble. This one, I'm sort of reserving judgment. I'm really trying to keep myself broad. You know, I just realized I do that a lot. What we call as clustering or cluster reasoning, where we combine several different entities and seek a common explanation for them rather than dealing with each of them individually. Imagine drawing a few circles, each representing a clinical variable in a case and making a Venn diagram. And whatever diagnosis goes into that middle overlapping area, bam, I got my differential. For example, as soon as I hear the words fever and rash pop up independently in the same HPI, I start thinking about fever plus rash. And that's how I find association between the clinical variables. Let's say diagnoses A, B, and C belong to the circle fever. B, C, D belong to the circle rash. Then the patient must have B or C, right? And before I even hear about anything else in the history or examine the patient, I'm already thinking about this list of specific diagnoses that I know have fever and rash in common. Tick-borne illness like Lyme and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, bacterial infections like meningococcal bacteremia or toxic shock syndrome, viral symptoms like uh, measles or varicella, and of course there are non-infectious causes too like stress syndrome. And of course, the skin findings of a lot of these are very different and may not fit my patient's rash at all. And I know a dermatologist would probably get very angry at me hearing how I describe all skin findings as the word rash. But it's a very convenient way to quickly come up with a long list of differential without knowing or hearing much more about this patient. The danger with this method is that you're implicitly assuming that all of the patient's findings are being caused by one unifying diagnosis, and that's dangerous because there's no guarantee of that. Cindy, I want to go back to what you were saying earlier about how Dr. Phillips spent much of his time exploring the possible relationships between this patient's clinical findings without speculating very much about specific diagnoses. I think that's significant because some cognitive researchers have suggested that Generating diagnostic hypotheses at a more abstract level? That is a behavior that distinguishes the expert from the non-expert. Non-experts tend to take clinical findings like fever, confusion, and rash and jump straight to speculating about specific diagnoses like Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I feel like I'm guilty of doing this all the time. Cindy, that Venn diagram approach you're talking about exemplifies this. Experts, meanwhile tend not to go straight to specific diagnoses. Instead, they make hypotheses about the nature of the patient's illness and the underlying pathophysiologic process. You'll notice so far, we haven't heard Dr. Phillips go very deep into lists. Instead, we hear him trying to distinguish between concepts like encephalitis versus encephalopathy, or infectious versus post-infectious, progression, progressive disease versus complication of disease rheumatologic or vasculitic. These are examples of what some authors call facets, intermediate hypotheses that bridge the gap between clinical findings and the patient's final diagnosis. Thinking about cases at the facet level, it's thought, helps the expert anticipate and interpret new data as it becomes available, rather than overcommitting down a rabbit hole, as Dr. Phillips says. It's probably not an accident lab Dr. Phillips does this. 
as an ID specialist, I imagine he deals with groups of diseases last year, a similar presentation, and often have to be tested for and empirically treated for at least initially at the same time. You know, and I just wonder whether we give ourselves enough opportunity to practice thinking in this way. I mean, I remember when I was a resident at Afternoon Report, the chief would present the case and they'd write on the chalkboard differential diagnosis. And as we went through the case, sometimes even after a single line of data, 55-year-old man presents with chest pain for a day, we'd go around the room and we'd be expected to provide specific diagnoses, PE, dissection, MI. It makes me wonder how we might approach clinical reasoning differently if, instead of being asked right off the bat, what could this be? Instead being asked, well, what can you discern about this patient's illness? What can you infer? What can you deduce? You know, Zhang, I just realized we made a mistake and forgot to ask Dr. Phillips for his formal problem representation. But listening to him speak, it makes sense that he thinks of his problem representation in broad terms, in the sense of what he considers to be the fundamental problem. A patient with an underlying chronic illness with constitutional symptoms and a rash on immunosuppressives suddenly deteriorates and develops a new problem. I think you're right. We are accustomed to thinking of problem representations in these eloquent one-sentence statements, but problem representations aren't summarizations of clinical findings. Problem representation is a process. It is the process of consciously and explicitly defining the problem we're trying to solve and the context we believe is relevant to solving it. We are framing the problem so that we're prepared to interpret new data as we receive it. Speaking of new data... Let's hear about the objective findings that were available to this patient's admitting team. Let's start with the usual labs. Her CBC is notable for a white count of 17 with 81% neutrophils. Her hemoglobin's 11 with an MCV of 86. Platelets are normal. Her basic metabolic panel, coagulation panel, and hepatic panel are also normal. Her urine analysis shows 3 plus blood and 2 plus Luke esterase. The microscopy shows 5 white blood cells, 5 red blood cells, rare bacteria with no squames and no CAS. A non con head CT is normal, after which she undergoes a lumbar puncture. The CSF fluid appears colorless but slightly hazy. The CSF in tube 4 contains 203 white blood cells, 76% PMNs and 18 red blood cells. The protein is slightly elevated to 52 with a normal glucose. There are no organisms seen on the CSF gram stain. HSV-PCR of the CSF is also negative. An MRI-MRA brain shows an acute infarct in the left parietal lobe. There are also very small subacute infarcts in the bilateral cerebral hemispheres and possibly a small amount of blood in the posterior sylvian fissure. Her ANA titer is mildly elevated at 1 to 80 in a speckled pattern. The anti-Smith double-stranded DNA, SCL, centromere, and SSA, SSB are all negative. The C anca is detectably elevated, while the P anca is undetectable. In terms of her complements, the C3 is slightly low at 77 with a normal C4. Her CRP is elevated to 40 and ESR to 42. The cryoglobulin assay is negative. Her influenza PCR, rapid HIV, hepatitis B, and C serologies are all negative. And she did have an interferon gamma release assay one month ago before her presentation that was also negative. And then, two days into her admission, her blood cultures from day one grow gram-positive cocci in pairs and chains. So that is the extent of the information we're going to hear about this case. What do you think? Take a moment, think through the case, lock in a diagnosis if you can, and see you after the break. Welcome back to Core AM's Hoofbeats. This week, we are trying to solve the case of a 57-year-old woman with confusion. What do you think is happening? Well, here's Dr. Phillips' take. So now you're sitting there thinking, that's interesting. Very interesting if that grew out as strep. 
because now you're starting to think, hmm, maybe another test I should get is an echocardiogram. Is this sort of an indolent strep endocarditis and associated vasculitis with that? And is that actually presenting and tying all this together? You know, the associated vasculitis with that. But I guess it could happen. So I'd have to start thinking along those lines. What Dr. Phillips is referring to here, of course, is that subacute endocarditis can manifest with what we consider as rheumatologic findings. Arthritis, bursitis, myalgia, etc. One of the rare symptoms is vasculitis. It's uncommon but well described in case reports and easy to miss unless you think about it. Although it's not in the typical illness script we learn for endocarditis, it shouldn't be surprising that you can develop vasculitis in the setting of chronic infection. There are other examples of this. Think about glomerulonephritis associated with hepatitis C. Hmm, how about the positive C inca in our patient? So it turns out that all sorts of chronic infections can give you a positive ANCA, and that includes infective endocarditis. Why is not well understood? This is what I read from one source. Persistent vascular injury by a bacterial antigen activates endothelial cells, which induces the expression of cytoplasmic enzymes by neutrophils, which results in the expression of autoantibodies. Take it if you will. So you're trying to tell me that this patient was harboring an endocarditis for a while now, manifesting as a vasculitis that was misdiagnosed as some kind of rheumatologic condition until she finally throws a septa embolus or maybe ruptures a mycota aneurysm and then comes in for the neurologic symptoms. Now it's all coming together. It's a very cool case. Well, it's a compelling hypothesis to be sure. But interestingly, Dr. Phillips questions it almost as soon as he proposes it. Let's say she does have subacute bacterial endocarditis. In the back of my head, I'm still wondering, is, is that the only cause of this and this months-long history of purpura on her legs and these headaches and that kind of stuff? You know, we have evidence of vasculitis. We know that can happen with subacute bacterial endocarditis. But is it, you know, is this all, uh, you know, I've seen endocarditis, but I haven't seen, you know, every endocarditis. You know, is this within the spectrum we'd expect? Or again, is this somebody that, that, you know, she has a positive Cianca, right? Is there, is there something else going on here? You know, Dr. Phillips is right. Um, the causal model of endocarditis provoking vasculitis is such an intellectually sexy idea. And deep down, you know we want that to be true. An outcomes racer that slices through every single finding of this case. But if we overcome the thrill and dig deeper, not necessarily everything fits 100% perfectly. Because, you know what, you wallop somebody with 30 or 40 milligrams of prednisone for two weeks. You know, the classic thinking is, and again, I could be wrong, but you have an untreated bacterial infection during that time? Well, you would think she would just be almost septic by the time she got to you. That is true. From the history we got, we didn't get a sense of the patient getting even a little bit worse after the course of prednisone, right? Which would be surprising even if she was harboring the most indolent kind of bacterial endocarditis. So, Zhang, are you prepared to tell us the diagnosis? Well, so here's the rub. In the real world, the MRI that showed infarcts in multiple vascular territories, that certainly was worrisome for a cardioembolic process. So... Indeed, when a transthoracic echo was performed, it showed vegetations on the mitral valve, and the blood cultures ultimately speciated as Streptococcus viridans. So at the time, I remember becoming very excited about this theory that we just discussed. I mean, could subacute bacterial endocarditis explain the entirety of her presentation? I found myself reading case descriptions of endocarditis from the pre-antibiotic era, when these kinds of presentations, i.e. as vasculitis, they were more common simply because the disease had more time to develop. People weren't randomly getting Z-packs for colds. But, you know, now, thinking about this case more carefully, as Dr. Phillips is saying, you can't actually prove this actually happened. And there are some things that don't really fit. There are alternative models for her disease as well. I mean, could she have had an underlying rheumatologic condition that caused her rash and predisposed her to the infective endocarditis in the first place? I mean, we know that conditions like lupus are a risk factor for the formation of sterile vegetations on heart valves. That's the first step in the development of, of infective endocarditis. 
Or did the immunosuppressive medicines she was on predispose her to developing the bacteremia that then led to the endocarditis? But again, that theory is imperfect. I don't really think of steroid use as a risk factor for Virdan's bacteremia. Could be wrong. Hmm. Now that we're making multiple causal models and trying to make everything fit into one story, I'm reminded of Alcom's arch nemesis, Dr. Hickam, who is famous for saying, a man can have as many diseases as he damn well pleases. Are we trying too hard to explain everything with a unifying theory? Are we stretching? I think all the models we've talked about so far are valid. I think they're all valid, but for the time being, with the data available. Uh, I am reminded of Joseph Crabtree, another foe of Occam, who may or may not have been a real person. He is famous for this philosophy, and I quote, no set of mutually inconsistent observations can exist for which some human intellect cannot conceive a coherent explanation, however complicated. Nicely put. We really have to watch out when we doctors get too brainy and overzealous because we definitely have the intellect to forge clinical findings into a theory and convince patients that's the final and ultimate truth. I can't tell if that's a compliment or an insult, but yes, I think that we get used to academic discussions where there's a neat final answer. And in reality, such a thing may not exist. We have to live with that. In this case, we may never know if she had coexisting infectious and rheumatologic processes going on, or whether endocarditis was the one true answer that explained everything. And if you think about it, it's quite challenging to learn from cases like this. Which brings us to the concept of dynastic uncertainty. Like we talked about earlier, naturally we don't want uncertainty to assist, and one way we try to eliminate it is relying on the dichotomy of test results. When our patients come in, we order a slew of tests and render them anemic in the process, hoping that the studies will come back to give us yes or no answers so that we can cross things off our list. Here, here. I do not want uncertainty to exist. I do not like the idea of the diagnosis being hidden, you know, beyond the event horizon of the patient's presentation. One would think that if we can simply improve the sensitivity and specificity of our binary positive, negative you know, system of qualitative tests to the max, we could significantly simplify our diagnostic evaluation. Well, in medical school, we all learned to also take into account the disease prevalence and pretest probability. Well, in practice, I tend to forget those when we see a quote-unquote good test. Dr. Phillips gave us an example of when he would not base his therapeutic decision on a good test. Say we have a hypothetical patient with hepatitis on mycophenolate. So there's that patient and the environment they're in. And then, of course, for infections, although you can sort of equate this to, to toxins and other things, there's what's the potential pathogens that are involved. And it's that triangle that kind of dictates presentation. And I know that, well, the suppression of T cell function and the associated with cell sept is probably CMV reactivation is the number one infectious complication with that, okay? And let's say I get a CMV PCR that's negative. This individual has hepatitis, been on cell sept, PCR is negative. That's going to increase my concern, although it would be very rare for PCR to be false negative. But I would think, particularly with these serologies, not so much CMV PCR, which gives us levels and quantification of it, you know, but the qualitative, the yes-no PCRs, if that's negative and yet my clinical suspicion is high, and I know she's on a med that's dropping her T or rendering her T cells less effective, then I'm willing to sort of say, well, maybe we should maybe we should continue to consider that as a diagnostic possibility and maybe even treat for it. There's another framework Dr. Phillips returned to repeatedly during our discussion, the epidemiologic triad of host, environment, and pathogen. That's just, I think, another way in which he uses relationships between aspects of the case rather than focusing on the clinical findings. To me, the striking part was that even a very good test is not good enough for him to remove a diagnosis when his suspicion is high enough. That really takes a lot of courage and confidence in your clinical knowledge and reasoning, backed with years of experience and seeing enough of these cases to treat through a negative PCR test like that. I know I certainly don't have the guts to do it, and especially when the patient looks at me and asks, you said the PCR test is negative and it's a good test. That reminded me there are studies out there that suggest 
experienced physicians who are comfortable with diagnostic uncertainty and sharing that with the patients are more likely to spend more time gathering information and less likely to commit premature closure. I also think it takes a lot of confidence, and this might sound paradoxical, for him to say out loud that he hasn't seen every case of endocarditis. I mean, of course, it's true, but to get at his underlying meaning, Dr. Phillips, with his decades of experience as an ID specialist, says something like that, then who am I as a junior attending to be able to tell my team and my patients with confidence, well, I know what you have and I know how to fix it. I know, I know that feeling. I have to admit, I feel a sense of anxiety associated with diagnostic uncertainty. And that emotion probably pushes me to want to commit to a diagnosis, sometimes maybe too early. I feel the same way. Actually, Dr. Phillips did talk to us about that. And I can tell you, the times I always get burned, because you, I do get, you all get burned, right? Is, is that I suppress that little buzzer, that little spidey sense, that little increased anxiety, you know? You can't get paralyzed by that or else you would never be able to leave the hospital, right? But sort of suppressing that sense that this is, some, this is a diversion. So a lot of experts say diagnostic uncertainty is unavoidable, and we should accept that fact. Dr. Phillips is telling us here, when our patients go off their illness script or when something feels wrong, don't be overwhelmed by that anxiety, but also don't get so comfortable to the point of ignoring it. Turn that into a driving force to push you to revisit your reasoning process one more time. It's all nice and easy to say that diagnostic uncertainty is unavoidable and all that, but I have to at least do my best to reduce it or narrow it down, right? We said that the dichotomy of test results are not necessarily helpful. So what do I do? And I think the way you know, I explain it to the patient is be honest and sort of say, which I'm feeling better about doing now than I certainly was earlier on, and saying, you know what, we really, we got something, we know what we're treating with, well, let's, let's go through what the medications can do, let's talk about the time course, you know, so that I want you to know that, so that you can know when to contact us if there's problems, right? But here's what I'm going to look for. I'm going to look for you to start getting better, and we, this should all clear up, et cetera, we're going to treat you with this period of time, you know, we're going to see you back over time. But each of us needs to be cognizant of the fact that if, you know, if when we finish all the treatment and things get better, you know, that you're still having, you know, these, these other symptoms, that you, your headaches aren't completely resolved, that we need to keep thinking about this because uh, it, it may not be so simple. Once again, we see Dr. Phillips use time to help his evaluation. When we start out the diagnostic process with very little information, the possibilities are endless. Through thorough data gathering, integration, and interpretation, we are usually able to narrow that list down to a few working diagnoses. Observing the response to therapy is a very powerful discrimination strategy that can often help us at that last stage. There's something else Dr. Phillips alludes to here, and that's what ethical responsibility we have to share our uncertainty with our patients. There are studies that suggest less experienced physicians tend to be more reluctant in doing this and sharing their uncertainty with their patients. But it's also been shown that physicians who believe that their patients will react negatively when they disclose their uncertainty are more likely to then be paternalistic and to make unilateral decisions for a patient. So shall we summarize what we touch on working through this case and hearing from Dr. Phillips? Right, Cindy. Well, to start, we talked about causal reasoning and the importance of fully exploring the different ways in which the findings in a case could be related to one another. We talked about the use of cluster reasoning using a Venn diagram to arrive at a list of diagnoses, which could be premature if we use the tool out of the clinical context. Right. Let's take a step back, put down our lists, and ask ourselves what we know about our patient's illness. We talked about how endocarditis can present as vasculitis, and that it requires a high index of clinical suspicion to diagnose early. And that, as satisfying as a final diagnosis like this might seem, Crabtree's bludgeon reminds us never to assume that an elegant hypothesis is a proven hypothesis. We also talked about how diagnostic uncertainty is often unavoidable, and it's not something that can be eliminated by tests. 
and how we can use that uncertainty to sharpen our awareness and to empower our patients rather than trying to hide it from ourselves or from others. And I think that should do it for this week. We want to thank Drs. Michael Phillips and Shreya Trivedi for weighing in on this episode. Special thanks to our audio editors for this episode, Richard Chen and Harid Shah. And as always, an honorable mention to Dr. Stephen Liu. Do you have comments about this case, discussion, or commentary? We would love to hear your thoughts on this month's episode or ideas for future episodes. Send us an email at coreimpodcast at gmail.com. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at, at coreimpodcast. Opinions expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent the opinions of NYU or other affiliated institutions, nor should they be construed as medical advice. Please, reason forward responsibly. Thank you for joining us with Core IM. I'm John Wong. And I'm Cindy Fain. Thank you again and see you next time. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can. In the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC.